And uh, I'll ease in by just uh, highlighting a couple of the messages that I sent or the announcements that I sent earlier today. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for uh, tackling the midterm. I was able to grade that one essay question, uh, which people did quite well on. Uh, overall, the midterm scores were lower than I would have liked them to be. Uh, so what I did was I just took the high score and I added enough points to it to um, get to 100. So I'm adding 24 points to everybody's uh, midterm score. And I, I don't want you to feel bad about the midterm scores. I mean, I know it's frustrating for you because, you know, many of you are, you know, great students and are, you know, aspiring perfectionists. Um, it's really just a function that we didn't get to spend any time with appreciation. And because of the, the things that have been going on in my world, I just haven't been able to um, help you guys as much as I wanted to. So I, I mentioned in one of the messages also, uh, I would encourage you not to worry too much about grades. I'm not going to hang anybody out there on the grades. Um, as long as you have scores in all the boxes, regardless of what those scores are, uh, you're not escaping with anything less than a B minus. And of course, for many of you, uh, it'll probably be quite better than that. Um, and that's just, um, you know, I don't, because of my circumstances, I don't want uh, that to be an impact on your guys's grades. And then I also proposed some uh, things that I could do if you uh, are interested in learning more about taxes than maybe what we might accomplish during the term. Uh, I can leave the website open uh, through the summer. We can continue to do some things if that is helpful for some of you. And then also I can just add uh, you to the section that we'll do in the fall. And I'm anticipating that things will uh, go more smoothly then. Um, and so that's just kind of uh, an update uh, related to the, you know, sort of the challenges that we've been facing. I want to talk tonight about uh, the chapter for the week, which is rental income, which is primarily uh, a Schedule E issue. And I want to take us through the Schedule E, and I'm going to work through the chapter simultaneously. So I'm going to kind of put the E on the screen, but I'm also going to flip through the pages of the of the book. Um, just I'm not going to you know like read what's in the book or or cover that in too great a detail, but I'm going to use it as an outline. Uh, to prompt me to share things with you that uh, I think are the important parts. And so if you have your text and you want to flip it open to 9-3, which is where the chapter starts, I will uh, see if I can throw up a Schedule E here. So is everybody seeing the Schedule E now? Yeah. Great. So uh, let me, before I go to the chapter, let me just highlight what's on the Schedule E here because not all of it pertains to our discussion tonight. Uh, the front part here, part one, is really for rental property. And you can have multiple rental properties. And if you happen to have, I don't know, say six rental properties, you would just attach another Schedule E and you would put, you know, A is one, B is two, C is three, and then D, E, and F as four, five, and six, which would come on the second uh, Schedule E. And it, it looks and feels a little bit like the Schedule C in terms of it's got rental income and then expenses associated with it. But on the back of the form, which this is the part that doesn't really pertain to us much, it has income from partnerships and income from S corporations, and then income and losses from estates and trusts, and then Remex, which are real estate mortgage uh, investment conduits, and then it has sort of a summary. What all of these things have in common, the reason why they land on the Schedule E together is by default, without some exception otherwise, those, all of those items are passive activities. And so in the tax code, we distinguish between sort of this earned income, which is W-2s and Schedule C types of things where you're like, performing or exchanging your time or your effort for some, you know, some, for some income of some kind. So we have that kind of earned income and then we have portfolio income, which is really capital gains and interest income and things that we've 
sort of looked at interest income a little bit, but we'll be switching uh, next week to look at capital gains issues in greater detail. So that's portfolio income. And then we have this passive income, which is income that you, you receive, but you really don't have, you know, it's not really portfolio income and you're not really actively involved in earning that income. You're passive. Um, so real estate is the most common passive activity. Uh, but partnerships as corporations and those other things on page two are also considered uh, passive activities. So with that in mind, I'm going to flip now to the chapter and uh, they start with this definition of rental income. And the only really important thing there is you're going to report the cash that you received or, you know, the checks, the, the rental checks that people wrote. And then the other sort of really interesting thing here is if you trade renting a place, uh, to a person. So um, say you rent uh, your house to somebody and instead of charging them the first month's rent, they build you a new fence or they build you a new deck or they paint the outside of the house. You're supposed to report as rental income the fair market value of whatever it was that you received. And so sometimes, you know, this will happen with people who are rehabbing houses or something like that. Somebody will be the buyer of the house and they'll have the money and then they'll like let, let a person who's really good with repairs live there for free for six months while they sort of renovate the place and they do all of this stuff. So certainly if you paid for materials and supplies out of pocket, that wouldn't be rental income, but the fair market value of what you got uh, from the person that you did the trade with is supposed to be rental income. So for example, let's say they built a fence for you and, and you kind of get a couple of bids and it's like, I don't know, a $2,500 fence. You pay for supplies, they were $750. So the difference between the $2,500 and the $750 is the fair market value of this thing that you received and you're gonna consider that as rental income. So that's in kind of 9.3 and then they get into uh, rent expenses, which we'll get into when we, when we kind of uh, look more specifically at what's on the schedule uh, E. Uh, nine five, you probably remember um, at least a little bit from uh, last week's depreciation issues. Rental real estate is gonna be a straight line depreciation over 27 and a half years. And um, it's gonna be what we refer to as the mid-month convention where the month that we place it in service, we're gonna take half a month's depreciation and the month in which we sell it, we're gonna take half a month's uh, depreciation. And it doesn't matter when in the month we buy it or sell it, we're still just gonna take that half a month. Um, so you, you can really calculate um, residential rental, real estate rental depreciation pretty easily. You can kind of just take, if it's a, if it's a full year and it wasn't the year of acquisition or the year of disposal, then it's going to be 12 over 330 months and that's going to be your uh, straight line depreciation uh, for rental property. Now, if you convert your personal residence to a rental, one of the things that we have to know is we have to know the basis or the amount that we're going to subject to depreciation. And here we're going to use, and this is on 9.5, we're going to use the lesser of our basis or the fair market value at the time that we convert it to a rental. So let's say I, I buy a home uh, 20 years ago and I paid $100,000 for it and I'm going along and it's 20 years later and it's worth uh, $250,000 and I get transferred for work and so it's kind of a lousy real estate market, let's suppose, and so I decide to rent it rather than uh, sell it. Well, in that case, it's the lesser of the fair market value, $250,000, or my basis, which would probably be $100,000 plus maybe if I did some repairs or something, put a new roof on or something, those things might alter or increase my basis. Uh, but I'm going to use the lower $100,000 number as the amount that is subjected or used for uh, depreciation. And so that's in kind of 9-5 where they take you through uh, that discussion of how uh, that works. They mention here uh, vacation homes in 9.5 also. I'm going to talk about that separately in just a minute because they're going to show us uh, that, that formula on the next page. 
for how we allocate uh, expenses. But I just want to point out that if you rent your property for less than 15 days, so you know, 14 days, let's say, um, that's all uh, tax-free money. You don't even have to report it anywhere. So um, I'll give you a small example of where that has happened. Uh, here in Eugene, every once in a while we get the Olympic trials here and there's uh, some neighborhoods fairly close to where they hold those trials. And sometimes people will just go away for the couple of weeks that the Olympic trials are underway and rent their homes to athletes or um, you know, people who are involved with the, with the production of the event. And if it's less than the 14 days, then whatever they get in terms of rent on that is just, you know, it's just entirely uh, tax free. Um, this happens, uh, it happened last time they had the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. Uh, people did that. Um, so, I mean, it could theoretically happen if you were doing the Airbnb and you just rented for 10 days, then you might be able to exclude all of that rental income uh, from a tax return. So if you stay under the 15 day mark, uh, you just might be good. I've, I've also uh, run into a couple of cases, not personally, but I've heard about a couple of cases where people have some uh, nice farmland or they have a spectacular garden and they may rent it out um, you know, say eight Saturdays in the summer for weddings or something. And so since that's less than the 15 day mark, uh, that can all be tax free income and you literally uh, don't report it anywhere on your tax return. It's not required uh, under the code. So as I flip the page here, uh, looking at nine six, this is the vacation rental situation. Um, and you've got uh, basically what we're going to do is we're going to apportion or proportion uh, our expenses between our personal use and our rental use. So let's keep it fairly simple. Let's say that I uh, have this vacation home and I rent it out 50 days and I stay there 50 days. Um, and I don't know. Let's see. Uh, it could be in. Um, I don't know, let's say I have a condo in the gorge and during peak season, I rent it out for those 50 days and, you know, windsurfer people come and hang out there and stand up paddleboard people come and, you know, and they rent it and, and that works pretty good, say for uh, June, July and August. And then I spend 50 days there in the winter because I want to get away from the crowds and live a quiet life or something like that. Basically what I do is I report all of my rent that I received from those 50 days on my Schedule E. And then I take the total days that it was used, which in this case was 100, and I put the rental days over the total, 50 over 100, and I'm going to take 50% of my indirect costs uh, on my Schedule E. So I'm going to take half of the uh, insurance, I'm going to take half of the property taxes, I'm going to take half of the depreciation, and I'm going to take half of the mortgage interest uh, on my Schedule E. And to the extent that there's that half that I don't use on the Schedule E, if I can, I'll put it on my Schedule A. So if, uh, you know, if, it, if I only have two homes, we know from studying the Schedule A that I can take mortgage interest on up to two homes, so I might be able to get that on the Schedule A. I can take the property taxes on the Schedule A. Uh, I, of course, can't take the depreciation on the Schedule A, and I can't take the insurance on the Schedule A. But those items that I could put on the Schedule A, because they're now part of the 50% that's more personal in nature, uh, you know, I first try to put them on the Schedule E, and then the portion that don't fit on the Schedule E go on the Schedule A. And this comes up with people who have, uh, where it primarily comes up is people who have condos. So people who have condos in Sun River or Eagle Crest or Salishan at the coast or, you know, wherever these kind of resort destinations are, people tend to rent those. Uh, and then when they're not rented, they tend to use them personally and they have to do this allocation process. It's not particularly difficult once you understand what's happening. Um, but it does require some, uh, some extra uh, calculations. Um, one little caveat in 9.7, uh, 
expenses limited uh, for certain vacation homes. One of the tricks here with the uh, vacation home is you cannot use the vacation home to create a loss. So I can lose money on a regular duplex or a home or something like that, but I can't drive a negative number onto my Schedule E. Well, it actually you know, gets to be a negative number down near the bottom of the Schedule E, but it doesn't come over or flow over as a negative number uh, on the 1040. And so you might look at those notes uh, on the bottom of 97 as you're, as you're sort of going along. And they, and they take you through several uh, examples there. Um, on 910, they start to talk more specifically about the Schedule E, and they kind of take you through that uh, problem there. I'll just use the Schedule E on the screen here to just uh, make a few comments on the reporting or the compliance aspects of it. So starting at the top, you know, name and social security number, nothing new there. That's, that's kind of what ties it in with your tax return. You may have to do 1099s, and this drives uh, rental property people crazy. We're kind of used to this if we're a small business. We know that if we have vendors that are unincorporated that we pay more than $600 in a year, we may have to send them a 1099. But people don't realize that if you have rental property and you pay a plumber who's unincorporated $1,200 for the year to, I don't know, do something around your house or around your rental property, you are probably supposed to submit a 1099 to them. Uh, and I, I, to be honest, many people who have rental properties fail to do that, but they're, they're supposed to do that. If you have a, you know, a management company or somebody who's helping you uh, man to manage your rental real estate, then typically they would take on that task. But uh, this is, uh, you know, A and B are kind of a, a difficult deal. So uh, A is, did you have any that you should have done 1099s? And if you say yes to A, you sure better say a yes to B. And those are the same trap questions that we saw on the schedule, uh, the schedule C also. List the address of your property uh, in sort of 1A, uh, you know, A, B, and C, you can just list, if you have multiple rentals, let's just assume there's one, so you'd put the address of the property uh, on line A. Uh, and then the, the type of the property, you know, almost always it's uh, residential uh, rental. It, a lot of times it can be single family, but some people out there own duplexes or triplexes. Um, of course, it could be uh, vacation rental. It could be commercial or land. Uh, you could have uh, land rental, um, and this may be something that you might see a bit more about out in your guys' neck of the woods. Uh, somebody owns a, a chunk of land, and they rent it to the farmer who lives next door. Uh, you know, they don't want to farm anymore, and so they just do a land lease of some sort, uh, and that could generate uh, rental income. Um, and then self-rental, this is a difficult situation. This would be if you had a business that was incorporated. So let's say I start a corporation and I'm doing, um, I don't know, I'm selling widgets out of my corporation. And so I rent to myself. I basically, my corporation rents my garage, then that's a self-rental. And in that situation, uh, the IRS is going to be a little bit nervous because they're going to worry about you manipulating the rents to achieve uh, some kind of uh, weird tax advantage. And so when you do self rentals, you very much should rent at the fair market value. So you should do a survey of like, well, what does, uh, you know, I'm trying to think about my garage, let's say it's 20 by 20. So what does a 400 square foot a storage unit rent for in your neck of the woods and then you know come up with an equivalent fair market value and set the rent uh, based on what is reasonable. Don't set the rent high to try to make your corporation unprofitable and don't set the rent low to try to avoid personal income taxes. Um, so that's that's what's going on there. Whenever a, a client puts uh, down a seven for the type of property um, that just makes me pretty nervous and I start asking all those questions to try to figure out uh, if they're doing things the way they are supposed to. Uh, back here to number three, which is the vacation and the short-term rentals. If you put down three, 
then um, you need to put in your fair rental days and your personal days because that's how the IRS is going to know uh, how you did the calculation that we talked before and allocated your um, your expenses, you know, whether, you know, so they can kind of track whether or not those allocations were reasonable and fair. Uh, the personal use days are really, um, they must contain a significant component of personal use. And so the way that some uh, taxpayers get around this is if you can show that you spent sort of the better part of the day doing maintenance or managing your property, then that's not a personal use day. So let's say I have that condo in the Columbia Gorge again and I go up uh, for the weekend and I spend five hours on Saturday um, talking with my property manager and doing a thorough cleaning of it because it's been rented out and then I spend five hours on Sunday um, I don't know, sealing the deck or um, propping up the fence or doing some general maintenance. The kind of the moment that the maintenance starts to rise to around half a day ish, then it becomes a maintenance day, not a personal use day. And I don't have to count it as a day of use at all. So if I had 50 rental days and 50 personal use days and then 10 maintenance days, it would still be 50% and those 10 days would just fall off the books because they're not they're not a rental day and they're not a personal use day. So they just don't count uh, at all. So that was sort of a long winded uh, discussion of that section up there. Your rents pop in, your royalties don't apply here. Uh, royalties would be like if you wrote a book and got royalties, that's a, a different kind of passive income that slides in on the same form, but it's not uh, germane to our conversation here today. So then expenses. So advertising, uh, if you, you know, put it in one of these uh, publications or you run an ad in the newspaper to get it rented, um, that's, uh, you know, line five. Uh, travel to and from the rental to do maintenance or to do management types of things can be deductible on six. Uh, you have to meet kind of the same criteria as we saw on the Schedule C where you're going to take the uh, you know, probably going to take the standard mileage rate because you're, it's not going to uh, about, amount to enough to look at taking your actual expenses. Uh, cleaning and maintenance, this is kind of something that comes up uh, a lot when you have a turnover, somebody moves out, somebody new is going to move in, you know, you, you normally clean the carpets, do all these different things, maybe you paint, do some sprucing up, those kinds of things. Uh, commissions, which may be something you pay to a realtor who helps you get it rented. Uh, your insurance and rental insurance costs more than regular homeowners insurance. So uh, you want to make sure that you uh, get that insurance and get, get your property covered so that you don't have any losses that way. Uh, legal and other professional fees. So if you have, if you have to hire an attorney or you have somebody do the books or something of that nature, if you hire a management firm that goes on line 11, if you have mortgage interest that goes on line 12, uh, eventually, you know, you're just like all other loans, your mortgage interest kind of amortizes away over time and starts, you know, it starts out big and then near the end of the loan is pretty small. And so uh, lots of rental real estate loses money initially in the beginning and then becomes profitable uh, as you hold the property longer. Other interest and then repairs. I will say on line 14 with repairs, the IRS has kind of come out with some new rules on repairs. There has been a lot of uh, fighting over the years on repairs. Uh, of course, we want to call everything a repair because that means we can deduct it. We can deduct it immediately. Things like putting in new sidewalks and a new driveway, uh, those are probably long-term assets that need to be uh, depreciated. Uh, the IRS thinks that fences are long-term assets that should be depreciated. If you repair the roof, that's a repair, but if you replace the roof, uh, that's a long-term asset that probably should be depreciated. Most all of those assets are depreciated over the 27 and a half year life as a separate asset. But when you dispose of it, like say I put a roof on and then 10 years later I have to put a new roof on, I'm gonna take uh, the last of the depreciation in the year 
that I dispose of the old roof and put a new roof on. So I'm not really going to take the full 27 and a half years to get all the deductions. It's going to depend upon the life of the item. Uh, supplies, you know, that's cleaning supplies and paint. Well, paint would probably go under repairs, but just various minor supplies that you might need. Uh, file folders for the office, those kinds of things, you know, to track stuff. And then your taxes, which would uh, generally here we're thinking property taxes and then your utilities. And again, many of these items, if it was a vacation home, we'd have to apportion them. Uh, but if it's a clean, straight rental where it's rented uh, for the majority of the year and it's not a type of vacation property, then we would take them all here. And then there's your depreciation on uh, line 18. You can have other expenses. Um, it's kind of rare. Uh, you have other expenses a lot with a Schedule C, but most everything with a rental property under Schedule E fits into one of the categories. And so um, it's, you know, not that you couldn't have a line 19 other expense. It's just not something you see very often. Uh, add them all up, total expenses, and then um, then you sort of in the bottom part of the form here, uh, you get your deductible rental real estate losses after any limitations. And you can have limitations here uh, two ways. You can have passive loss limitations and you can have uh, limitations because it's a vacation home and you can't use it to uh, create uh, a loss. And so with that, I wanna go back to the book for a minute and uh, the at-risk rules, those are not very important on 912, but this definition of passive losses and passive activities on 913 is kind of an important idea. Back during the Reagan administration, which was, for those of you that are you know, younger than me, that was in the 80s, uh, there were a lot of people that were using uh, passive business activities to generate large losses with depreciation to shield other earned income from taxes. And so we had a major overhaul in the 80s that created the passive activity loss rules, which basically say that if you have a passive activity and you have a loss, you cannot deduct that passive loss against earned income unless you have some passive income uh, to use the loss against or you dispose of the activity. So let's say I'm going along and I'm renting my uh, real estate and I have a $3,000 loss. Uh, if I have no other passive income, then that becomes a suspended passive loss and I just have this $3,000 loss. And then the next year I have another $3,000 loss. So now I have suspended passive losses of $6,000. And then in the third year, I have another $3,000 loss. So I have s suspended passive losses of $9,000. In the third year, I sell the property. At that point, I can use the losses against the profit from selling the property, or even if there is no profit from selling the property, I can take those losses at that time. So I can either take the passive losses against the passive income if I have passive income. Otherwise, the losses are suspended and you deduct them when you dispose of the activity. Um, and again, that's to prevent people from getting too good of a tax advantage, basically from the depreciation tax shield. So I wanted to discuss that, and then I want, to, want you to flip the page over to 914 and see the $25,000 special deduction for active participants. So... If you have AGI that is uh, less than, and I don't remember the amount here, less than $100,000, uh, excuse me, yeah, less than $100,000, then for rental property, so residential rental property, you can have, an, you can have passive losses up to $25,000 that are deductible immediately. So I just explained all of those passive loss rules to you, and now here's an exception. And the exception is for people that have uh, moderate income to low income, 
that are renting their property and they have losses, they may be able to deduct them right away. And so if you look on 915 in that paragraph below the blue box, you can see $25,000. That's the maximum you can take. It's reduced 50% uh, dollar for dollar above $100,000 up to uh, $150,000. And so basically if I'm at uh, $110,000 in AGI, then instead of being able to deduct $25,000, I'm $10,000 over. Half of that is five, and so the maximum I can, the maximum amount I can deduct is twenty thousand dollars. What they were trying to do here is you have these big shot investors that we wanted to deny the ability to take losses against their other income, but then you have the person who gets uh, transferred for their work, takes a promotion, and has to move to another city. And if they are in a lousy housing market, they just want to rent their house for a couple of years. Uh, so they can sell it later. Maybe they want to wait and see if the uh, transfer works out. And so this is kind of, you know, this is, I consider this kind of the exception for the normal people or the exception for uh, the person who's not really trying to be a, an investor in real estate, not really trying to be uh, engaged in a lot of passive activities. They're just sort of caught by life circumstances. Are you guys still there? I got a little static there for a minute, so. I'm still here. I'm still here. Okay, very good. So that's what's going on with that rule. That's what we refer to as the active participation rule, uh, which is a very nice rule, helps a lot of people out who uh, sort of find themselves as a casual landlord. They didn't really intend to be a landlord, but life circumstances, uh, you know, cause them to end up being a landlord. It could happen. Uh, maybe they inherit a property um, and then they, they don't really know what to do with it right away. So they rent it for a few years before they uh, dispose of it. And so they may be able to use these active participation rules if their adjusted gross income uh, is mild enough to allow that to happen. There is a discussion on 916 of what happens with suspended losses. Don't pay much attention to that. Um, you can look through it. I don't think it's beyond your ability. Uh, it's just um, not something that I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about, so you don't need to be uh, deeply concerned about that issue. And so that kind of takes us through uh, the big things with rental property. Um, I want to I want to close tonight uh, with just a, a a little bit of a, I guess discussion of uh, the treatment of real estate in the tax code in general. The tax code is extremely favorable to, uh, to, uh, to real estate. Um, so we've got these active participation rules with the $25,000 that get you around the uh, passive loss rules. That's pretty great for a would be first time investor in uh, you know, a small scale uh, rental activity. And then the other thing that you have is you have what's called the Section 121 uh, exclusion, which this is an exclusion we'll talk about more next week, but this is the rule that says that if it's your principal residence and you've lived there two out of the last five years, mm -hmm. then you can sell that property and any gain that you make can be excluded up to uh, $250,000 if you're single and uh, half a million dollars if you're a married filing joint couple. Um, so that's just two uh, uh, ideas. I'll give you a, a third one, right? The deductibility on the Schedule A of your mortgage interest and your property taxes. And so there are a lot of incentives uh, for owning real estate in the tax code. And part of this is to encourage um, home ownership. It's uh, to encourage um, uh, you know, just rehabbing, improving, renting, bringing rental real estate uh, to market. And so one of the things, you know, now that we have a, a more robust real estate market going on again, these things kind of disappeared during the Great Recession, but now you're starting to hear all these commercials again about how you too can make money in real estate. Um, and there's really two ways. Uh, 
Um, one is people buy homes, they move into them. Uh, maybe they, and I knew some college kids that did this for a while, they would buy homes, they would move into them, they would basically just camp in them. And for two years, they would sort of do all of these uh, repairs and maintenance. You know, they were young people, they had uh, physical ability and some skills. And so they would just live there for two years, these two people. And they would just work like crazy on this home and then they would sell it for $100,000 more than what they bought it for because they, you know, was dilapidated when they bought it and they did all these improvements. And they would get this nice big uh, capital gains and it would be excluded from tax because it was their principal residence and they lived there for two out of the, the five years. So that's, that's one trick they'll tell you if you go to one of these seminars about how you too can make money in real estate. I'm being obnoxious now. Uh, the other one is the Schedule E issue. And so what people try to do is they try to buy their real estate so that they can rent it for the mortgage payment and the property taxes and the insurance. And then maybe they can get just a little bit more than that uh, to cover their repairs and maintenance. Uh, and then what happens is they're kind of break even on their cash flow, but then they take that big uh, depreciation deduction. And I'm gonna do a little calculation here real quick. Uh, I'm gonna take a $250,000 piece of rental property, and I'm gonna divide it by 330 months, which basically gives you $757 worth of depreciation each month, and I'm gonna multiply that by 12. And so that's $9,000 in depreciation uh, in a year. And so if I can buy a piece of property and then rent it for the mortgage payment that I'm paying and then rent it. And if I can cover my mortgage interest and I can cover my property taxes and I can cover my management fees and I can cover a little bit of maintenance, then I'm like break even on the cash flow. The rent that comes in pays all the bills for the real estate. But meanwhile, I get a $9,000 deduction and let's say I can be an active participant. That's going to flow over as a $9,000 loss on my uh, 1040, which is going to save me 25% in taxes, which is going to be a little bit more than $2,000 a year in taxes that I'm going to save. And since I was losing $9,000 on that piece of real estate, which was a $250,000 piece of real estate, I can roughly, I mean, I can't quite own three of them, but let's just assume that I can kind of almost own three of them. Three times 9,000 would be 20, what is that, 27,000, which would be a little bit over the $25,000 cap, but just, just play along with me for a minute. So I could create a $25,000 loss, which would save me, if I'm in a 25% tax bracket, a significant amount in tax dollars. But now I own $750,000 worth of real estate that I'm basically getting somebody else to pay for because the rents are covering all of my uh, payments. Now, if I can get a real estate market that goes up 10%, 10% on $750,000 is $75,000. So that's how you make money in real estate is you use the tax code to try to create these tax losses that save you money and then you try to leverage and hold real estate that you think is going to appreciate uh, in value. Now to do this, you need to have uh, the ability to borrow money. So you need good credit. Uh, you need uh, some kind of a down payment that will kind of get you there. Uh, you need a piece of property that uh, has a high uh, rental demands, has low uh, maintenance costs over time, um, you know, and, uh, Keenly, one of the things that you need is you need a real estate market that's going up in value rather than going down in value. But when you can assemble those different uh, things, then you can use that depreciation tax shield along with the active participant, active participation rules uh, to have the tax code help you make money uh, in real estate. And so you could either do it with the flip uh, where you live in it and it's excluded capital gains, or you could do it by uh, turning it into a rental property and using these other uh, features that we've just talked about tonight. And basically, when you hear people talk about, you know, their real estate systems or all these different, you know, these different seminars that you can go to, they're walking you through all of those different issues step by step and talking uh, about how all of that works out. I just find it interesting that 
um, you know, sometimes they charge people quite a bit of money and they get quite a large audience for these things because people, uh, I guess, want to learn how to do these things or maybe there's the, the lure of uh, quick or easy money, but it is not a risk-free endeavor. You need to understand how uh, all of those pieces fit together and how the tax code works in order to uh, make it all turn out for you. So uh, save your money and don't go to the seminar. Just uh, you know, read your tax book. You'll be you'll be better off. Um, I wanted to turn my or turn your attention to uh, Milo Torrent, the next tax problem, which uh, I think is due uh, next week or excuse me, not next week, uh, is due this coming Saturday. So I think this is the third tax problem here, due this coming Saturday. Here it is here. Um, I'll pop it on the screen here for a moment for you. Uh, she's a self-employed person, so we're gonna do the Schedule C, which we, uh, we didn't get to talk about depreciation, but fortunately we did uh, get a Zoom session in uh, on the Schedule C a little bit. Her business information up here, nothing really big happening, just uh, tell, telling us about it. She's got some other expenses here. These uh, reimbursement of actual expenses for a business trip, so that seems like nothing. Here's a Schedule A uh, issue, but I don't think she's going to be able to itemize her deductions, so the charitable contributions are probably going to uh, fall away. The personal electric bill, she can't deduct on her Schedule C. The Chamber of Commerce dues, that feels like marketing expense or that feels like business promotion expense. So I would slide the $125 uh, into her Schedule C. She's got down here in this paragraph uh, $100 in W-2 wages for the month, so $1,200, uh, some federal income tax withholding. So that's just a front of the 1040 and back of the 1040 issue, a uh, pretty clean cut there. Uh, $300 in taxable interest, $5,000 in estimated tax payments. So those go on the back of the 1040 as part of the payments that she did. She's got a mileage issue, which will be figured, uh, which will end up on the Schedule C in the automobile expenses, but will be calculated or disclosed on page two of the Schedule C. And then here is her P&L which will basically drop into the Schedule C. So I put an extra $125 in this 6541 for advertising expense. And then in the car and truck expense, I would work with this number a little bit to see whether or not that is a mileage reimbursement number or whether or not those are actual expenses and see which one is the better number uh, to take. Once that's gonna make her Schedule C uh, profit a little bit different than this 30,290, but not a lot different. And then that number is going to be, she doesn't have a home office, so we don't have to worry about that, but that number is going to be subjected to the self-employment tax. So you're going to need to do a schedule S E uh, to calculate what the self-employment tax is. And that's a tax that will go on the back of the 1040 uh, along with her income tax. Um, and then she'll be able to deduct half of that self-employment tax as an adjustment for adjusted gross income on the front of the 1040. So that's kind of just a really brief highlight of uh, some of the issues related to this week's tax problem. And you certainly can send me uh, some messages or some questions if you, if you get stumped or run, in, run into anything on that also. And I think, um, I think just in the interest of, um, you know, we've, you know, it's been difficult for me to keep up with you guys. Uh, so what I think I'll do is I'll, I'll extend the deadline to at least Sunday um, so that if you need to send me a message on Friday, uh, that just gives us a little bit more time. And uh, I, don't, I don't think this problem will give you a lot of trouble. I think you're well prepared for this problem, but um, just want to leave the door open so that I can be of more help uh, if possible. So that's, that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, 